with Ryan Reese. This is live with Ryan Reese. Call now, 1-888-564-6173. Or post your questions using the hashtag LiveRyanReese on his Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. Another beautiful night, day night in Southern California. I have one of my good friends, Samantha Summers, Revis, in studio tonight, uh, out from Las Vegas. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hey, how's Vegas been anyway lately? Man, right now, it was actually hotter out here than it was in Vegas. Really? Yeah. So we were low 60s over there. So, you know, it's it's a little bit weird coming into hot weather when you're leaving Vegas because everybody know. just assumes you're going to be hot in Vegas. So everything's good over there, man. It gets like, I remember I was there when we did that, conf- that concert out there. It was like 100, I think it was 120. Yeah. But it gets yeah. hotter than that. Uh, yeah, like out, out in the bare desert oh, okay. area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it was sure. so hot that we had the metal militia in the parking lot on their dirt bikes to, to flip. And they said that they had to wait for it to cool down a little bit because the rubber. Oh, my Because, you know, they're, they're jumping yeah. and they're flipping. And yeah, 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 obviously yeah. the rubber, the, the heat, you just, you need that traction. And I was like, wow, it is hot out here if they yeah. got to worry about the rubber of the tires. Yeah. <laughs> like you got to wake up in the middle of the night and make sure you're drinking water because you're like, you'll like start choking. Cause you're just, it's so dry. The air is so dry. Dude, that's so nuts. Well, I love Vegas, man. It's, uh, God's moving out there. And I yeah. love that church that you're a part of with Derek Nider, Pastor yep. Derek Nider, uh, Calvary Chapel, Spring Valley. It's now Calvary Chapel, Las Vegas. Oh, I heard actually. Yeah. Someone recently told yeah. me about that. Yeah. Congratulations. I know. That's super exciting. <laughs> that's <laughs> what if that, weird. What if that, but, like, yeah. just that end cap name. You know, it's just, it's really neat. There's there's so much going on over there. And we're we're so grateful to be at that church, you know. Mm-hmm. It's not, and you know, it's it's not about a pastor. It's not about a man. It's but the not pastor a, is amazing, though. Yeah, he's pretty dope. <laughs> like, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> he's awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we just love that church, you know. He teaches verse by verse. He yep. t- keeps us accountable, um, you know. I can text him whenever. My husband can t- text him whenever. Same thing mm-hmm. with his wife. Like, you know, they're just... Real down to earth, like real walking it out, Jesus freaks. I love Derek Nider. He's he's always been so cool and he loves you, dude. Real, I know. I love. He you. loves you so much. <laughs> <laughs> he was actually at the conference. Uh, you know, when I when I spoke, he texted me, "Hey, brother, I love you." <laughs> yeah, I'm like, dude. where you at? Couldn't find him, but <laughs> no, it's really cool. They got a school out there, and they're yeah. um they're a Calvary Chapel in Las Vegas. Um, right, cl- not right next to the strip, but you know, fifteen minutes. Away yeah, from very the strip. close yeah. to the strip. But um, they got a cool thing going, and this is actually this show syndicated in Las Vegas. Yes. What's the station out there? Do you oh, know? Oh man, I don't remember it <laughs> don't off the top Wait a of my is head. That it over there? I don't know, but I'll I know look. I know it runs out of our Calvary Chapel. Yeah, it, it is. It's I see the room there. I've never been in the room, but I see it like when we're running back. You guys actually took over the station out in Vegas. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, So So cool. Anyway, well, tonight, you guys, this show is going to get very intense in a good way. Um, Samantha's out here. Uh, We're going to be talking about her journey as a child and getting wrapped up in the wrong stuff and then eventually ending up into stripping and things that come along with that. The story, I would say, is going to be a, a walk from uh, the darkness into the light. Thank God. And uh, not only the fact that when she finds God, it's not like when you just find Jesus, it's all good overnight. There's a walk of faith out of the darkness yeah. after you find the light, yeah. which is really pretty gnarly, I would say, my personal walk. and and. That's really where, like, the rubber meets the road is, like, once yeah. you get saved and it's, like, all hell breaks loose. <laughs> yes. Hey, well, let's get into Mentally. all hell breaking loose. <laughs> well, you know, um, I guess the best place to start is, uh, you know, when you grew up, like, what age, why would you even think? What were the events that led you to get involved with stripping? So uh, I was born in Fresno, California. Um, I lived there as a baby I don't remember it and then when I was um I say I I think when I was about 1 we moved over to Oklahoma City believe mm-hmm. it or not so mm-hmm. I used to have a cowboy I don't believe it. cowboy hat <laughs> and I used to run around the house screaming yeehaw all day mm-hmm. my mom tells me and so uh when I was about 4 we left over and we moved to Hollywood California um I'm an only child 
my dad had three other kids, but the youngest one to me was a 16 year age difference. Okay. So he was 16 when I was born. And so anyways, um, the, o- the older two, I don't have a relationship with at all, but the, my, my other brother, Robert, I do have a relationship with him. He's the one that we have a 16 year age gap in between us, but, uh, I didn't grow up with him. Uh, when we moved to Hollywood, we lived on Hollywood Boulevard and St. Andrews. And so like back then there was still cruising, like all the gangsters would come out every what Friday, what year Saturday was night. Um, well, I was born in Ish. 79, okay. so like 85, Okay, you know, from 85 and on. Um, we lived right there on Hollywood Boulevard. Uh, now, like, I try to take my oldest daughter, Valerie, back there to show her, like, hey, you know, this is how I grew up. Like, there were people shooting up heroin in the hallways. Like, there were cholos, like, initiating people in, like, empty apartments. Like, my dad's best friend was shot in the head point blank, like, at the 7-Eleven across the street. I try to show her that, and it's like, I, we go down there, and they're building, like, high-rise condos. You know, it's all nice now and stuff. And she's like, I thought you said it was real ghetto down here. And I was like, uh, I swear, it was. I'm like, it was, <laughs> dude. I was not living in no high-rise condo. And so, anyways, uh, my dad uh, had been in the military. He was in the Air He served in the Air Force. Mm-hmm. He served in the Army. Um, he was a military police officer. And so, he was retired. Um, and my dad was Irish, English, and German. My mom is Guatemalan, oh. and my dad was six foot two. My mom is um, four foot eight, and so there was like there's you know a cultural difference. There's a lot of differences there, and yeah. so anyways, um, I really clung to my mom. Uh, I I wanted to have a close relationship with my dad, but he was just so like militant with everything and so strict that I just didn't feel that that softness, you know, that you feel like when, when you're with your mom. And so anyways, and um, military is like really, my, my dad was military. Yeah. Yeah. I know. And, you know, and you're like, okay, relax. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's, he's like, if you're there on time, you're late, you know, you gotta yeah, be exactly. 15 minutes early. So <laughs> he had me so freaked out. I was always like 30 minutes early to everything. So you I was here like early too, by the way. Good job. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so anyways, he, he was just, you know, that's just how he was. And so I didn't understand that. Now looking back, I understand, you know, and I don't I don't have a complaint about it now. But at at the time it started stirring up a lot of um anger inside mm-hmm. of me. And so um anyways, we lived there uh when I was thirteen. We lived in Hollywood. When I was thirteen, my dad got us on Section Eight, which is like a government funded program that helps to pay for um low income families to live mm-hmm. in other areas. So we he picks us up and he moves us over to Sherman Oaks. So we go from like living in the hood to like now like we live in this really nice area. It literally took me like three months to get used to going to sleep at night because there that? was no gunshots. There were no ambulances. There were no oh, dang. like police sirens going off. And so it was it was jarring. It was a, it was a cultural shock for yeah. me, you know, because I'm like I'm waiting for the rug to be pulled out from underneath underneath me basically and so you know I went to going school to school with my friends who had you know parents that were cholos or they were like slanging drugs or doing this or doing that and like you know moving living in Sherman Oaks everybody their parents are like they're like oh my dad's a screenwriter oh my dad's a producer oh my dad's a this and I'm like and now here you are in this (laughs) world (laughs) yeah I'm like oh great well you know I'm you know everybody's like shopping for like the newest you know whatever shoe that's out and this and that and I'm you know, I didn't know no better, so I, I just thought like everybody went to the thrift store when it was when it came time to like go to back to school shopping. You know, mm-hmm. I never had like a brand new spanking pair of shoes. You know, mm-hmm. like, and so um, or it was Payless. You know, and at the time it was all good. Like I didn't know any better. You know, yeah. so for me I was happy. You know, I was happy because I was like I got my mom, I got my dad, I did a lot of stuff with my mom, and so um, you know, for me it it just seemed like a normal childhood you know until I started going to junior high and then I started realizing like hey there's a bit of a difference here you know there is definitely a financial difference you know um and at the moment I don't think it made that big of an impact on me but it definitely like planted a seed you know what I'm saying Mm -hmm. yeah like now that I look back I'm like man like I, I can see where you know the little seeds were planted you know to eventually wind wind me up and get me like where I was going, which was, wasn't a good place. Mm -hmm. And so my dad died from lymphoma cancer when I was 16. 
Um, and I wa- we watched him die. You know, he came oh. home. He didn't want to be in the hospital. And so I remember holding up my dad and him taking his last breath. And, you know, at the time, it, like everything inside of him was just deteriorating. So he was constantly throwing up blood. And so I thought that he was going to go throw up. So I went to go help him, like hold him up. Mm-hmm. His body, he was a big, he was a big burly man, mm-hmm. you know. And so um, so it was really weird to see my dad weak and vulnerable like that. Yeah. I had never seen him like that, you know. And so anyways, I remember picking him up and I thought he was going to go, you know, throw up. And he, I just remember, I remember holding his body up. And I, I remember that feeling of when he exhaled. And then he just didn't inhale anymore, you mm-hmm. know. And so um, I was 16 when that happened. That was really traumatic for a six, me and well, my mom. For, yeah, for I mean, even for a 16-year-old, yeah. young 16-year-old girl, they need their dads yeah. in their life. Yeah. I mean, whether that, that connection was, was so deep or not, you still have I that totally father figure. I totally needed him, yeah. yeah. Just him. Just a father being around yeah. sets the tone. Totally. Totally. And now here you are, you're in Sherman Oaks. Your yeah, dad so passes away. My dad passed away, and um, my mom starts working. She had never really worked full time before. Stay at home mom. Yeah, she was mm-hmm. a stay at home mom. And so, you know, my mom just started working like 10, sometimes 12 hour days. And so I never saw my mom. So that to me was jarring because I go from like, my dad is dead, my mom is like not in oh, the I'm house at yeah. all. So it's like, I'm just sitting there and it's, you know, what was she supposed to do? She she needed to go to work. She she needed to provide for us, you yeah. know? And so, um, you know, it was just the circumstance at the moment. And so anyways. This is just really quick. This is very common for people that are listening. I mean, statistics say 50% of homes in some, in California are broken homes. Yeah. The dad, whether the dad's not around right. or passed away, and then you have the working mom, and then you have the child. So your story yeah. is fifty yeah. percent of California. Yeah, totally. It's it's very it's very typical. It's very common, and mm-hmm. I hear it a lot too with the girls that that we minister to. And so, um, you know, my mom's working, and I'm just a wreck. And so, um, I just started. You know, hanging out with the wrong people, drinking, doing drugs. Um, man, I did LSD for like a year straight. Like every time we were at school, we were just dropping tabs. You know? I don't know how you can do that stuff at school. That's crazy. That was dumb. Very like dumb. I look back and I'm like, how did how did we not die? You yeah. know what I'm saying? It's just it was it was a really bad time. Obviously, I made a lot of horrible mistakes. Mm-hmm. I made a, a lot of horrible decisions. You know, with the mental capability of a child, you know, it's not like... A distressed child. Exactly. It's not like I could have made any better... I mean, you know what I'm saying? I didn't have any structure. And so, anyways, um, I just was... I was already being promiscuous. um, And, you know, I was, you know, messing around with guys and girls. Mm -hmm. Whoever I could get attention from, I mean, I was down, you know? And so, um, anyways, when I turned... after my dad had died, I actually started working in retail because it just seemed, you know, easy. You know, I didn't really need to have like a degree or anything to go work, right. you know, at yeah. a retail shop. And so um, I had a neighbor in our building and I, her name was Danny. And I remember her coming and going whenever she wanted. And she always paid for cash for everything. Like we went out to eat. Like, you know, I know she had paid cash for some cars and, you know, she was just like, I knew she was saving up to buy a a house cash. And I was like, how does one buy a house cash? (laughs) You know what I'm saying? And so, um, anyways, I just remember asking her, I was like, what do you, what do you do? You know, how old is she? She, I want to say she was, she was 23, 24. Right. And so, and I was, you know, still a kid. I met her when I was like 17, about to be 18. Yeah. And so, anyways, um, I just uh, asked her, like, what do you do? Like, how how is it that you're able to do whatever you want? And she was like, oh, I work right here, you know, at, at this strip club. And, you know, I just, that's how I make my money. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, what do you do? And she just explained it to me. And she was like, you know, I just get up there and I dance naked for like two to three minutes and... You know, then I just get off stage and then I do private dances and I was like, what? You know, at this point, were you like, what was going on in your head? Were you just like, no way? Or like, maybe? 
Or I was I was shocked because I didn't even know that that existed. Oh, okay, you know what yeah. I'm saying? Because I was like, I don't know. I guess I, I was sheltered to some degree. I had never it, strip clubs back then weren't like it's what like they today, are now. Right? You know, yeah. now it's like super glamorized. It's in rap videos. I mean, it's like totally it, this is it's like mainstream. Like, like back then when you were a stripper, like you didn't tell nobody. You yeah, know what same. I'm saying? Now it's like you log on to somebody's social media and it's like their name, that they're a stripper and, yeah. you know, whatever. No, it's, it's just and it's different like, timing. You're right. Yeah, totally. And yeah. so back then it was like a totally different scene. And so anyways, when I turned 18, I went down there and I auditioned. They say it's an audition, but, you know, I, they, they don't turn nobody down. They're not going to turn anybody down. Gotcha. So. Um, because you pay them. Like as, as soon as you start your shift, you walk in there owing them money. Like no way. you have to pay to go to work. And so as soon as you step foot through the door, you're already in debt, you know? Wow. And then off of every single dance that you do, you have to give them their their commission. Right. Right? Because they're housing you. And so um, so they're basically like a makeshift pimp. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, they're pimping you out, dude. And so at the time, like, I didn't see it like that. I was just like, oh, my gosh, you know, I can make all this money and – um. I just thought that I would be able to provide for me and my mom. Like, well, dang, maybe I can save up cash for a house and, you know, pay cash for cars. Well, isn't it true? I mean, you know, I've talked to a lot of friends or people that have come even on the show that have they've come out of this lifestyle and they are doing it for good intentions. Yeah. To provide for their kids. Yeah. To go to school. Exactly. That's how. Yeah. That's like the that's like the lie. That's, the that's deception, the, hook. the hook that the enemy gets. He puts that in your mind. Right. You're going to go and provide for your family. Yeah. But he doesn't tell you about everything that comes along oh, yeah, with no. it. So you walk no, 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 in no. and you're, here you are. And just, you're young and you're invincible. You think you're invincible and you're immortal. And you're like, running the show. You're totally tough. Yeah. Like nothing hurts your feelings. Like you don't even have feelings, you know. And if, if feelings <laughs> yep. start, you know, starting up on you, you're just going to, you know, smoke a joint or, you know, do a line of coke or whatever, you know, yep. just to like dumb it down, dumb down those feelings. And so... I think I was just living my life so fast that I didn't have time to feel. I didn't have time to feel when my dad died. You know, I didn't have time to feel like when my mom had to go to work. I didn't I didn't have time to deal with those feelings because it was like, what are we going to do? You know, yeah. what, where do we go from here? And so I started working there. Um, and so it was an all nude strip club. And I say that just so that people understand that it's like a whole other level. You know, it's a whole other level of... Um, of anguish, you know, in your heart, in your mind, like the mental damage that it does to you, the scarring, it stays with you for years, you know, to this day when I minister to girls in the sex industry, I mean, in Vegas, at the strip clubs out there, when it's graduation time, on their marquees, they put now hiring class of 2016. No way. So I have little girls that are like, yeah. oh, you know, I want to go to this college, but I don't want to put my parents in debt. So I'm just going to go and work at the strip club, save up money. Again, the good intention, right? Mm-hmm. And then I, I'm quick to tell them like, yo, like, that's not, you're not going to do it because you're going to get addicted to that money. And then you're going to be like, well, I make more money here than I would, you know, if I became whatever. Let's talk about that for a second. So basically, I mean, if you go and you strip, say you, a girl could bring home like, a, let's say $1,000 a night. Yeah. You ain't going to make $1,000 a night or fifteen hundred or two thousand, you can make up to two grand, right, or something. Yeah. Who, oh my gosh. It, or more. I mean, more. Now you it's know, like who more. makes two thousand dollars a night? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You become addicted yeah. to the money. Yeah. So now, what went from good intentions? Exactly. After you get, what, so you pay so for your college. So the first hook was like the good intentions, like yeah. you're going to provide for your family, right? Mm-hmm. The second hook is the money. Mm-hmm. So you're literally, you know, like Satan goes fishing too, you know, mm-hmm. and so he's he's doing it for his dirty work. But there's a process though, yeah. Which and you could explain this a little bit more, for a girl to be able to go up and strip down. Yeah. I mean that's gnarly to be able to do that. Yeah. So like you have to like lose yourself in a sense. Yeah. There there these walls that we're all born with. Yeah. Those walls have to come down in order for you to do that. How does that happen? Is that for girls? Is it through drugs and alcohol that just brings those walls down? What's the yeah. process? Yeah, you know, when I worked, I made it. I made a rule for myself to make sure that I was never drunk and that I was never on anything. Mm-hmm. Because the last thing I wanted to do was to, you know, get raped or something happened to me, and mm-hmm. it's like then my mom would have found out. You know what I'm saying? Because I was constantly hiding that. Oh yeah, true. From my mom, right. and so. I just didn't, I didn't, I wanted to be in control. 
Mm-hmm. I wanted to be in control, and I wanted to make sure that I always knew what was going on. And so, but man, I saw so many girls, so many beautiful, smart, wonderful girls just completely lose themselves because they started drinking, they started doing drugs, they started, you know, ro- you know, rolling on ecstasy, like mm-hmm. they're doing lines of coke in the locker room. Because not only are some of them stripping, but some of them are like selling themselves too, that's, you know. In, in the back rooms, you could, you could, yeah. you know. You, Things well, can yeah. happen. Exactly. For well, money. the the club that I worked at, it was like you know you can get a dance or two or whatever, or you could rent a girl out for a half an hour or an hour, two hours, whatever. That's insane. And so it's it you know it just like where does it stop? There's it just mm. never does stop, you know. And so, anyways, I saw a lot of girls get caught up, and I mean, girls just that wouldn't come back. I'd hear like they over they overdosed or yeah. Whatever, and so that really, like, made me, like, oh, my gosh, I definitely don't want, I don't want that to be me. I didn't want to be a statistic. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And so, and, and I already was, realistically, I already was. And so, um, you know, I had a lot of female clients that would mm-hmm. come in. I had a lot of couples that would come in. Like, looking back now, my heart grieves. When I tell you I grieve, mm-hmm. it's, and, and, man, I'm so grateful for the grace of God. Mm -hmm. And I always tell this to the girls, like always remember God, he's, he's going to forgive you. If you, if you come with a heart full of like repent, like if you are really repenting, he is, he's going to forgive you Mm -hmm. and you will be forgiven, but you will not be free of consequence. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those consequences are memories. Mental. They're Mm -hmm. mental. They're smells. Dude, mm-hmm. for like years, I couldn't even use a Bath and Body Works spray. Yeah. Because I would almost have like a mental breakdown. You know what I'm saying? Because it just smelled like the locker room to me. Yeah. And so. Well, that that verse, you know, you reap what you sow. Yeah. You know, when you when you reap, when you go out and live this life, like you and me, we yeah. both have different crazy lives. But then you reap that stuff. Like I was talking to you know my wife the other day and this other pastor at the pastors conference, and I was just saying how, you know, I struggle with pornography. Yeah. Now, I don't go and watch porn. Yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah. not, I don't do that. I haven't watched porn in years. Right. But you reap what you sow. All the images in my mind. Yeah, it's all in I here. could see something on TV. I could hear something, music, something, and then it pops up these images and it brings you back. Yeah. yeah. You know, or you see someone, some girl, some girl that looks like some girl that you used to hook up with. Well, even forget just pornography, but just me even sleeping with girls. Yeah. I, that, I have all that in my mind still. Yeah. So yeah. you have that plus porn and everything else. Yeah. So I know what you're saying, but what this is what's awesome. This is what I wanted to end that part with is you reap what you sow. So if you start sowing the things of the spirit, you start going yeah. after the things of God, yeah. then you start reaping the things of God, yeah. the yeah. things of the spirit. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it works. You always hear it in a negative con- connotation, like you reap what you sow. You know, don't do it. You're, you're, yeah, it's going to yeah, be bad. Yeah, yeah. No, it's awesome because when you're following God, you're going to reap what you sow. Yeah. It's yeah. a great thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. And, you know, for me, um, thank God, like, through time, you know, now, man, I remember the first time I ever bought, like, a Bath and Body Works body spray, and it didn't bother me. Actually, Annie Lobert gave it to me. And I was like, when she handed it to me, I was like, I can't smell this kind of stuff. And she was like, "Are you, why? Are you okay? And I was like, no, it, like, I get enraged, and I just want to rip my brain out of my head. Like, I can't, I can't do it. And then... Uh, you know, she always wore them. And then like little by little, I just started like, it, you know, relaxing on that. It's just dumb little stuff like yeah. that, you know, that you got to work through. Totally. And so anyways, um, when I went, you know, going back to me having a lot of female clients, um, a lot of girls were selling themselves with their male clients. So I figured, well, you know, maybe if I'm only involved with my female clients like that, maybe I'm because I had been raised as a Catholic. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't, I knew of God, but I didn't know of a relationship with Christ. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I figured, man, you know, my, my toes are right on the line here, you know, which is totally wrong. That's what I, you know, your whole, I didn't know the Lord. I didn't know the word. I didn't know his word, you know? And so I was thinking, well, if I just, if I just only hook up with my female clients, like maybe at some point in time, I can still come back to God. So you're not sleeping with a man. No. So you're saying, okay, so that's the God. God won't frown on it. He's he's good. He's good with that. Yeah, that's awesome. That's that was my thinking, you yeah. know. And so but people think like that. Yeah, totally. So I'm not, I, and I say that, you know, with you know the preface of I'm not trying to say that, you know, that was okay. I'm just saying like that yeah. was my 
logic like, of frame of thought it, back then. Yeah. And so anyways, uh, that's that's where I was at. I wound up um, getting pregnant uh, by a man that I was seeing. And um, I thought, oh, man, I'm going to work throughout my pregnancy because there were girls that were working nine months pregnant. Huh? You know? I'm not joking. Like their regulars would still come in. And so and it wasn't like just one or two. It was like a lot of them. That's insane. And so I was like, oh, my gosh, if they can keep dancing, like maybe I can, too. And no, bro, that did not work out because somebody would come up to me and ask me for a dance and they would put their hand like on my shoulder, like to mm-hmm. tap me to get my attention. And I literally felt like they were touching the baby yeah. and I wanted to rip their skin off their face. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so it didn't help that my stage name was uh, Mistress Rage because I did a lot of S&M stuff and, oh, okay, and, and dominatrix stuff. Mm-hmm. And so I just felt like that rage kept, you know, mm-hmm. Which is the was enemy feeding the yes. fire the whole time, mm-hmm. and so, you know, I was just I was at a crossroads. You know, I was like, what am I gonna do? You know, I hadn't saved any money as quickly as the money came in and went back out. You know, I never went to school like I had thought I was gonna do. I never bought a car cash or even put down a down payment. That's on what car. the enemy does. He puts that yeah. shiny object, and nothing yeah. ever happens. I didn't do a dang thing, bro. Yeah, <laughs> like exactly. Everything that I thought I was going to go in there and do, like I didn't do one thing. And so, you know, I was just stuck and I didn't know what to do. And so honestly, for me getting pregnant, it really did. I mean, I feel like that whole situation, I mean, it, it helped me because I, it saved my life. You know, mm-hmm. I had guys follow me home. I remember one time a guy screaming my stage name from outside. Mind you, I'm in my apartment with my mom. Yeah, and people and guys become stalkers cuz it's all cuz the whole stripping and that, nobody ever that's told all me fantasy. That. No, yeah, nobody told it's me all that. fantasy, yeah. Nobody told me that somebody was going to become obsessed with me or like start stalking me like I didn't I didn't know any of that. Man, yeah. I was so scared. Yeah. And it wasn't just me. You know, I was thinking like, "Oh my gosh, if somebody comes into the apartment like my mom's here like what if they kill us both?" Like, you know, it was it was just a lot to take in. And so when I was pregnant with Valerie, I tried to work. I, I think I made it up to like three months, and then I just quit. I just I just couldn't go back anymore. I just couldn't do it. You yeah. know, it was it weighed on me. But you know what? Looking back, like it weighed weighed on my spirit, weighed on my soul. You know, and so I remember I can look back now and like see little tidbits of when God was chasing me. You know, mm-hmm. like when I was actually paying attention. And it's it stinks now because I just. I just look back and I'm like, dang, man, like, why didn't I listen right then and there? I should have listened. And, but you know, the, all that disobedience, like, and now where God has me, you know, it's, I'm so grateful mm-hmm. because God totally uses all that for his glory, you know, and I'm able to, I, I can relate to these girls that are working in the sex industry that are, you know, be, like, you know, working in prostitution or if they're being trafficked or, you know, they're working at the strip club or they're porn stars or, you know, they're, working in dominatrix stuff, like all these different facets, you know, and I'm even able to relate to guys, you know, Mm -hmm. that are, that have struggled with porn Mm -hmm. or struggled buying girls or struggled with going to the strip club. Like I'm able to really have like a brother sister talk and be like, bro, like this is not, this is not going to wind up good. This is going to cost you everything. I mean, I've seen marriages lost. I've when I worked at that club, I can't even tell you how many times wives came in looking for their husbands. I've heard, I've heard of that. Man, it and to look back and be like, dang, I was I was a part of that, you know? So anyways. Well, this is what we're gonna do. Because we're going to break yeah. in about one minute. So what I'm gonna do now, this story is intense. Cause this is actually the first time I actually sat down. we how long have we known each other? <sighs> years. Yeah, I mean dude, like eight years. Yeah. And and th- I mean I've heard a little bits, but this is the first time I've heard it in depth and it is yeah. Everything I thought it could be, it's amazing. And then some. But we're going to come back after the break and, and continue on how she got saved and then the journey out of the darkness. But if you guys have been following the Whosoever's movement, we are continuing to tour public high schools. Uh, we're doing concerts for the kids. We're giving out the gospel. We're trying to reach those kids before they end up in a situation where Samantha or myself ended up. Uh, you could go to the whosoever's.com. And learn more about that, but we will be back in two minutes right after the break. More live with Ryan Reese coming up. Is everything all right? Call now. 
1-888-564-6173. Or post your questions using the hashtag Live Ryan Reese on his Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. Uh, I think I speak for the entire administration when I say whoop de doo Now, back to live with Ryan Reese. Don't say what I warn you. Loud noises! Back with Samantha Summers Reeves. <laughs> <laughs> You know, typical Latin person. I gotta got. Uh, I gotta have like ten names. I know. So yeah. So we got your first last name, uh, some, uh, Summers, and then now your husband's name. Actually, you want to know what my legal name is? No. Yes, I do. Opal Samantha McKee Lopez Summers. That's and, your real name? Yeah, that's on my birth certificate. Oh my goodness gracious! <laughs> <laughs> and now it's Reva. So I have six names. <laughs> That Instagram cannot facilitate <laughs> that. <laughs> they cannot. <laughs> well, right before the break, we uh, we were just talking about how she uh, she grew up in Hollywood or wasn't grown up in Hollywood, but by the time she was a, in high school, she moved to Hollywood. Her father died. He was in the military, and that led her to a spiral and out of control. Her mom went to work, which is very common in, in California. I don't know about the rest of the United States, but statistics say 50% of kids – come from broken homes so the father's gone the mother's gone and that parent that's actually at home with the kid is working yeah doing what they're supposed to be doing providing right. for the family therefore the child grows up in the streets and the neighborhoods with friends and gets raised basically by the neighborhood right and that's what happened with her and that led to a series of events with let her stripping that she met her neighbor that was a stripper and you know the progression of sin and stripping and other things like that she wound up, you know, finding herself, um, finding clients, you know, with men and with women and kind of just doing all kinds of crazy stuff and a dominatrix and all that stuff. And now here she is at a point where she's got, she gets pregnant and she has to quit because she's three months pregnant and so, God's starting to reach out to her. The Holy Spirit is, is drawing her. And that's pretty much where we ended. So what happened yeah, at yeah. that? So you're in the strip club. You're three months pregnant. You're walking around, and a client will tap you like, "Hey, come here." Can I get a dance? And yeah. you're like, "And I'm like, you're touching the kid. You like, I'll don't kill you." Stop. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, for me, what really, what when I was like, what drew the line in the sand for me was I had a, uh, I had a guy grab me by the waist, and try to grab my my stomach, my tummy, and you know, at three months, you're not showing yet, but. Mm-mm. 
I like flipped out and I didn't want to get arrested for, you know, assaulting somebody. And so I just, I was like, I got to get out, you know, I got to get out. I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, you know, by this time I was, you know, heavy into like witchcraft. And so, you know, I had all kinds of altars and stuff in my room. And what kind of stuff were you doing in the witch? Were you, were you, was it like, uh, so it, what was it called? What kind? It was, so it's like brujerias. I don't know how to say that in, in English, but it's witchcraft and you're doing spells and you're praying to different saints and you're oh, putting like yeah, I've heard of that, offerings that. of like, you From know, Mexico. herbs and scents. Yeah, I guess it's it's Latin based, you mm -hmm. know. Um, and so I used to go to this lady that would read my cards and then she would tell me like these cleanses to do on my body. She just opening yourself to all kinds of crazy stuff. Oh my gosh, stuff. dude. Like the doors, I mean, yeah. it was it was gnarly. You know what I'm saying? And so, but again, I didn't know any better. I just thought like, okay, well, this is going to help me. And, um, you know, I was just so far into the occult that I didn't, I didn't know who I was or what I was doing anymore, you know? And so, uh, I left the club, I left the club and I wind up telling the guy that I'm seeing like, Hey, I'm pregnant and this is what it is. And, um, we're actually married today. So our daughter, Valerie, is just turned 16 on March 10th. Amazing. And so my son is here, uh, Jacob. He's also March 10th. So she's 2001 and he's 2006. That's ridiculous. When I tell you my administrative skills are on point, they're on point. Uh, I'm a clearly. planner. Clearly. <laughs> <laughs> but wait, but how did you find Jesus? So so listen, so I'm pregnant. I'm pregnant with Valerie. I leave the club. And I call Joe and I'm like, hey, I'm, I'm pregnant. This is what we're doing. And uh, we have Valerie. And um, I had a cousin of mine that I was really close to. He had a house up in the Hollywood Hills. Mm -hmm. um, his, his father was actually my dad's father. and uh, my, my dad's uh, cousin, I'm sorry. His mm -hmm. father, Bob, was my dad, Ken's cousin. And so, um, I, you know, I, I had found Robert, like, in my teen years, uh, and so I was just like, dude, we're cousins. Like, this is so cool. Blah, 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 blah. I felt like I had a piece of my dad still. Yeah, totally. And so, man, we hung out all the time. I mean, I, I wasn't a good influence either. You know, I would take him to strip clubs. Like he, he was a really dark kid. He was very intellectual. Like, man, if you wanted to sit down and have like a really good, like intellectual conversation, this would be the kid to do it. Mm -hmm. do it with he was just super mature and uh anyways his dad wound up passing away from cancer had bone marrow cancer and so we saw the cancer eat him up and uh five days later he committed suicide my cousin committed suicide no way and so he hung himself and uh so i have all this like mental baggage from yes. all this stuff and then he kills himself and i actually sent joe over to the house before i got there because I didn't know what I was going to walk into. And so it it was it was one of the worst. I mean, I felt like that death mm -hmm. was worse than when I lost my dad, mm -hmm. you know. And because um, this kid had everything, like a house up in the hills, like multi-million dollar estate, like properties everywhere, like, mm -hmm. you know. And he was just this surfer kid that didn't care. He didn't care about any of that stuff, you know. And so... Anyways, Joe was like, hey, I'm going to move to Vegas because I think that, you know, I can do better out there. There's a lot of, you know, you know, he's I don't even know what to say that he has a degree in because I forget. I know he has a degree in electronic engineering and some type of he's like a tech dude. Like he can build a computer from the ground up. Got it. And so Techie. anyways, yeah, he like hooks things up like for Christmas. We could turn on and off the Christmas tree lights through the Alexa and I was oh, like, Alexa. yeah, but he had it connected. like, And so you can like turn. I was like, dude, I don't know how you do this stuff, but that's really weird. <laughs> and so anyways, I'm like, OK, well, so we move out to Vegas and uh, I was working at the win. I was working at the salon out there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually a makeup artist by trade, been doing makeup for 20 years. And so we were in the in the dining room, the employee dining room one day, just me and a couple girls from work. And man, you know, everything that I had gone through had weighed on me so hard. You know, when Robert committed suicide, I called my mom up and I was like, you take down every picture of Jesus that you have in the house. And I want you to get that, you know, I was like cussing. I was like, get that effing Bible out of my house, this and that. Yep. I don't ever, don't you ever 
say God or Jesus to me ever again. Don't pray for me. I remember people would come to the house mm-hmm. and offer to pray for us. I would lock myself in my room because I didn't, I didn't want to hear it. I was just so bitter at God, you know, and I'm like, man, my dad died, like, basically like a hoe at this point. Like, mm-hmm. you know, I, I felt so dirty. I have a baby now. And then my cousin kills himself. It's like, well, what am I going to do? Like, I don't have any money. You know, we live in Sherman Oaks. It's like, I'm, how am I going to buy a house for this baby to grow up in? A nice SUV, you know, I'm thinking, like, how am I going to do any of this? And so when, J- when when Joe was like, hey, let's move to Vegas, I was like, okay, this is going to help us, you know, in some way, shape, shape or form, because the cost of living out there is so much cheaper. So mm-hmm. when these girls totally. invited me to church, when I, we, were, we were in the employee dining room at the Wynn, and they were like, hey, it's going to be Easter. Do you go to church? And I was Are like— Are these girls that work at your salon? Yeah, at okay. the time. I was working at the salon at yeah. the time. And so— I was like, no, I, I don't go to church, you know? And I, I remembered, like, when they asked me that, I remembered telling my mom what I, what I said, you know? Yeah. And so, like, I could feel the tears, like, working up in my eyes. And so, anyways, I was like, no, I don't go to church. And they were like, oh, you should go to church with us. You know, it's going to be Easter. And, man, I just broke down crying because I couldn't believe that I could go to church. I'm thinking, oh, I Cause got out, you know, like there's mm-hmm. no way I'm going to be able to go to church. Plus I'm so dirty. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like I'm no. going to dirty those walls as soon as I start walking in, you mm-hmm. know? And, and then I was thinking, okay, well, if I go to church and then I start making friends with the ladies at church, like who's going to want to be my friend, Yeah, you know, like who's going yeah. to want to talk to me? And Which so, is all lies from the enemy. Oh, totally. Just if for the listeners. Totally. These totally are lies. all lies the enemy set you up with. Yeah. Why yeah. would you go? You're going to dirty the place. Who wants to be your friend? No one wants anything. That's what churches are for. They're hospitals for the broken. Yes. For me, for Samantha, yeah. for you. Yeah. Praise God, man. So we went to church and literally, man, for like months when we would pull up, just pull up into the parking lot, I would burst out crying. Like I would just start crying. Well, that that I did go to church that that Easter Sunday, yeah. and and I got saved. I got <laughs> saved because when as soon as he did the altar call, I don't up. even remember what he said, <laughs> but he was like, "Jesus is for you, and he wants you, so come on up here." And I was like, "Jesus wants me." Like I was so tired, dude. I yeah. really thought, I really thought if I didn't if I didn't get some type of mental help. Yeah. Mental help being like Jesus. You yeah, know what I'm saying? Totally. Like if I didn't get that, I was going to kill myself, dude, because I was but I didn't know how I was going to be able to do that because I knew the hurt that Robert left in my in my heart by him committing suicide. How was I going to do that to my kid? You know what I'm saying? I didn't want her yeah. to think that she, I didn't love her enough to stay because to this day, that's how I feel. You know, like Robert didn't love me enough to stay, you know. Mm-hmm. And it's hard not to think that I know that he was, you know, he was lost. He didn't know the Lord, you know. And so anyways, it, you know, it, I didn't want to do that to her. And so I just started going to church. And man, I, like anytime those doors were open, I was there. I mean, anything. Yeah. They had conferences. When they would have conferences, if I saw that the bathrooms were dirty, I'd start cleaning them myself. Like anything, anything I could do to like serve the Lord, I totally did it. You know, Amazing. like once... Once I gave my heart to him, because that's God one thing I do. Yeah. Like, I love hard. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I'm loving him even harder because I am I can feel all this love that he's giving me, you know? And it's like, there's no strings attached. And I'm thinking, man, this is going to be great. You know, like, my life is going to be totally awesome now. And, you know, I thought it, it was for a minute, right? And then God starts pruning and and doing you know pulling the weeds and doing all this stuff in my heart so a, a way to explain that for people that maybe aren't believers yeah, in yeah, christ yeah. what god's doing is he's he's he starts working in our lives and he starts uh removing this stuff yeah. the weeds in a sense is the stuff that are cluttering our life things that god does not want in our lives we're not we're not created for these things right. so as he starts pruning yeah what happened during that process so that sucked. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does, and it hurts. It hurts when, so when bad. I want to. I want to give a little illustration. When you get gold and you want to purify it, they they put it into hot fire. fire yeah. And when you put it into the hot fire, what it does is it burns out that black stuff. And when it burns out that black stuff, you have that pure 
gold yeah. with no no weeds, no black stuff. Yeah. And that's what God does is he puts you through the fire. It says in Hebrews, it says that God mm. is a consuming fire. Yeah. And when you allow him, when you invite him into your life, he comes into our life. The Holy Spirit comes into our life and the job of the Holy Spirit, because he sends torrents of living water, it's the holiness from heaven that comes in and starts purifying everything that is unholy in our lives, pushing it out of our lives yeah. or ripping it out or like a consuming fire, burning it out. Yeah. Yeah. And when you're in this process, what 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 happened? I mean, so I got I got saved that one Easter Sunday. I think Joe gave his heart to the Lord like maybe like three or four weeks later. You know, it was a process for him. Mm -hmm. And so, um, man, I when I did it, I hit the floor running though. And so Joe kind of like prayed the prayer, and then that was it. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like he didn't hit the floor running. But that's cool though, because everyone's in different places yeah, in totally, their walk. Totally, everyone's in totally. different places. And so. And he was, you know, he had, he himself had been struggling with porn for such a long time, you know? And so for him, when he met me, he meets the stripper. It's like, it's fulfilling that fantasy. You know what I'm saying? So he's thinking like, okay, I, I have this, this girl now and it, we're going to, I'm going to be able to fulfill everything that I've been watching. You know what I'm saying? And so yep. that's what he's thinking. And um, it's crazy because I just saw, I watched uh, Christy Mack. That was she's a porn star and she was beat by her UFC boyfriend. I watched oh, the oh, yeah. whole trial. Oh, and she, man, she was talking about like you know she's not she's like I know I have this image. She's like, but she was talking about when he would beat her and when um I forgot his name is John uh that uh, but I forgot what yeah his I, can't, UFC I forget name. his fight name yeah yeah I t uh and so anyways she said you know he like had this fantasy of me and she's like, I couldn't keep up. You know, she's like, I, I'm a type of girl that I like to, I like to hang out on the couch and let's chill and cuddle. You know, she's like, I couldn't keep up with his appetite, you know? And so I was like, man, I have that saved, you know, with the rest of my ministry stuff, because I'm like, I want for, for guys to hear that, you know, it's a fantasy. It's you're being sold this lie. That's not even real, you know? And so, um, Anyways, we're I, you and know, that's 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 what destroys marriages. It does because guys that watch pornography, porn, it does. They they're seeing all this 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 these these sex acts, which are all set up yeah. and shot yeah. hours after hours, totally, and, and then this, edited totally perfectly. And, and behind the scene, you talk to strippers and or, or porn stars and stuff. Yeah. These girls are actually being hurt in the process. Yeah. They're on drugs to numb the pain. Yeah, totally. So now. You have this guys, the average Joe Schmo, watching yeah. these videos. Then they have their wife, yeah. and they try and make this happen, which is not even a reality for the porn stars. The porn no. stars are getting hurt and on yeah. drugs. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, when Joe met me, he's like, he met this stripper, and he thought that, you know, everything was going to be a certain way, and then we're married. We have a we have a, a daughter. We I'm sorry. We weren't married yet. We got married a year after we got saved because we were sitting in church, and I'm like, I felt convicted. I was like, um, we should probably go get married because they keep talking about marriage and <laughs> yeah. living in sin. And I'm like, we're totally living in sin. You know, and I, I'm like, you know, little bit. But that was, again, like another thing that God was showing me, like I needed to clean up. And, and it's a slow process. Exactly, dude. It was so slow he's process. so gentle. And so anyways, you know, Joe dealing with that, like you would have thought like, oh, our marriage was great. But Joe was dealing with his own stuff. I'm trying not to get triggered by these memories that I have, you know, and so. We almost we almost got divorced. I believe it. It was so bad, and this is after coming to the Lord, you know. And we're thinking, I'm thinking like everything's gonna be good, you know. And um, man, you know, I start. I actually met Annie uh, Lobert Lobe. from Hookers for Jesus, mm -hmm. and I started. I was her ministries that reach out to, to call girls, girls, porn stars, yep, and yeah, and girls that are being trafficked and, and stuff. And so, and she has the Destiny House over there in Las Vegas, which is a safe home for the girls. Mm -hmm. And so I met her and she was the first person that I ever opened up to and told her my story. And man, when I tell you how much of an impact her ministry had on me and, and had on my life, dude, like how God used that, I'm forever grateful. You know what I'm saying? I'll be forever grateful because she's encouraged me. She has come alongside of me, like poured into me, like always pointed me to Jesus. You know, I mean, she, her, that ministry has so much heart. Annie has so much heart, especially for the girls that are coming out of the industry. Mm -hmm. I was lost, dude. I didn't, I didn't know who to talk to. I didn't know what to do. And so, um, I started traveling with Annie. I was her executive assistant for many years. And so, uh, we, you know, I first, 
first time I met you was at the uh, One Love for Chi event at Pomona. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's, she was so like, she calls me yeah. up. And oh, she's yeah. Like, that's right. You showed up yeah. when she was speaking there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And she's like, hey, you want to go with me to L.A.? And I was like, OK. And so, um, you know, but same thing, too. Like the first time I went out and outreach with her, like I remember telling her, like, Annie, like, man, I, I struggle with same sex attraction. Like, I, I, how do you want me to minister to these girls? And like, I'm probably going to be looking at them. And all I'm thinking is like, I'm going to totally mess this up for God. And God, God's let me back in his house. And I'm thinking like, <laughs> I don't want to ruin this. Like, I don't want to ruin what we have going on. And I'm, I'm just thinking like, I'm, you know, I'm going to ruin it, you know, and I didn't want to, I didn't want to in any way, shape or form. And so she's like, Sammy, you just got to pray. You just got to trust God. Like, you know, that's Annie. She's always like, the, the pep top like encourager like she's always just like you can do it da, 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 da. and you're like you're crazy but all right like I'm gonna totally pray and believe we're gonna believe together and so you know the first time I went out on, a, on an outreach with her and we went to go talk to these girls and give them gift bags man I like in a strip club we or, were, wait, no we're, we were out on the strip okay cool on the strip and so I just remember looking at these girls and not thinking one lustful thought Amazing. And I could not believe it. It literally, Ryan, it was like a switch had been turned off inside of me. And I was so shocked. But then, like, months after that, every time we went out, like, I'm waiting for the rug to be pulled out from underneath mm -hmm. me, you know, because that was, like, the sequence of my life. Like, something good would happen, but then I'd take two steps back. And so, man, praise God, I just, you know, I see those girls as God sees them, like mm -hmm. the daughters of the king. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so I'm so grateful to have every ounce of lust stripped from my heart, dude. Like, I just don't, I don't struggle with that. Thank God. And I understand when men do. You know, I just had a good conversation with Joe the other day, and he was talking about, you know, he works at Bellagio. Mm -hmm. And so there's girls coming in and out of there all the time, and he's like, you know, I'm trying to, you know, like you said, you're trying to wrangle your thoughts because you've seen these images, and they, these images are popping back in, and, and, you know, it was a really good conversation, and I think we prayed at the end, and he hugged me, and he was like, I'm so grateful that I can talk to you like this. Yeah. You know? And I'm like, yeah, dude. I'm like, my heart breaks for you. Like, I don't have one ounce of jealousy. I don't feel any of this because I feel broken for you. I used to think like how you think, you know? And that's, and that's, so what, that's what the enemy does, though. He, he likes to – because – you know, we'll be tempted. There's temptation. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's that's not a sin to be tempted. It's to yeah, yeah, act yeah. on it's it. It's to act on and it. And we live in a fallen world. Yeah. And we reap what we sow. Yeah. But the thing is, is what Satan likes to do, and you notice this, is that he doesn't want us to talk about it. But no. when you bring the darkness into the light mm -hmm. and expose it, people get set free. Totally. Because I'm not walking around like I'm struggling with pornography. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just those temptations, those things will pop up here yeah. and there, and all of a sudden, then you react, and you instantly you either go, you look, you start lusting, and then you take that next step, or yeah. you bring your mind into subjection with Christ and go, exactly. boom, Satan, nope. And that's the war that's constantly yeah. as we walk through, you know, walk walk by faith. Yeah, yeah. But you know, it was awesome because what you said is, uh, you said how you've been God did that work in you. And that's when we ask God for the Holy Spirit. He sends his Holy Spirit inside of us. Yeah. And what happens is it's a supernatural work. He works in us before he can work through us. Yeah. It's a supernatural work. You know, you may be listening right now and you're going, well, man, I, there's no way God can change me. It all comes down to the point where you say, Jesus, forgive me for my sins. Come into my yeah. life. I surrender. And you you wave your white flag to God and yeah. you let him to come. You let, you let him send his Holy Spirit down from heaven, the power from heaven. And he will baptize you with his Holy Spirit. And then he's going to start working slowly through you. Yeah. And he's going to start purging or pulling out those weeds or whatever you want to call it. And he's going to start purifying your mind. He's going to start transforming your mind, your heart. And you, one day you're going you're gonna to be looking around going, I don't know if I cuss anymore. Or, hey, man, I don't struggle with pornography anymore. Yeah. I don't even feel like doing drugs anymore. What? What? I don't know. Yeah. Maybe you're a liar. I mean, <laughs> Yeah, whatever well, it is. Maybe right? you struggle with same yeah. sex, sex attraction, whatever it is. Yeah. You just you just come to God and you just ask him to just to start working your life and you read the Bible, which is the yes. DNA of Jesus Christ. The key is yes. reading the Bible. You can't just say, Jesus, forgive me for my sins, change my life. You have to read the Bible. And there's a difference between reading the Bible and actually studying the Bible. Studying the Bible. And yeah. that's when you, why we go to church, because yeah. we study the Bible. Reading is very important. 
But then when you have someone break it down to you, yeah. you just take it to that next level. Well, five years after we had given our hearts to the Lord, that's actually what really helped Joe is that we actually uh, got, we, Joe said that he in prayer felt like God was calling us to go to Calvary Chapel, Las Vegas. And so, you know, you, you, you've you known me for a while. Like we're loud. We're like, you know, we were like super loud in church. And so I'm like, oh man, I don't think they're going to let me go in there, you know? And we got three minutes left. So. And Go, so, tell me. Anyways, he we start going to Calvary Chapel, Las Vegas, and you guys are allowed though, by the way. Oh yeah, totally. <laughs> we are. We are allowed. And you know, Derek just lo- loved on him, and Joe started going to men's Bible studies. He started awesome. meeting with with Pastor Derek like one on one, and you know, our our marriage has never been better. Like Amazing. we feel like we are dating all over again. And so it's really cool because now God's laid it on our hearts to to launch a ministry um, with using both of us. And so we'll be based out of Calvary Chapel, Las Vegas. Dude, that's we so just rad. had a meeting with, with Pastor Derek like a couple weeks ago. And, so, and he's totally backing us. And we're just, we're really excited. I've, you know, when I shared it with Annie, I was really excited to share her with her what God had laid on on our hearts, you mm-hmm. know. And she's like, Sammy, we're going to work side by side. And I, I just love that. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, I love the family of Christ and like how God is, where where God has us right now, you know, and, and with our kids. And I'm just, I'm just so grateful. So, so grateful. And you know what? Your dad I listened to your dad online for a, a really long time before we transitioned over to Calvary Chapel, Las Vegas, and your dad had a key part in that, dude. Like, God really used him teaching verse by verse. Yep. Man, I remember watching Raw, and I would it would take me like 30 minutes to get up off, out of my chair because I was so convicted and so heavy. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but, yeah. But it was like God doing like all this work inside of me, and so— you know, when Joe said Calvary Chapel, Las Vegas, I was like, all right. You know, I'm like, I, I trust that guy, Raul Reese, that I watched. So it's like, I remember when Amor was on here, Amor uh-huh, Sierra, and yeah. she was like, you know, I watch your dad all the time. Okay, I'm lying. When I don't want to be convicted and I want to have a pity party, like I don't want him. <laughs> you know, and it's like, yeah. you know, that's so true because the, the Holy Spirit totally uses them. And we do get convicted from that verse by verse teaching like that, you know. Well, you know what? This interview has been amazing. And Thank that's you. You, you nailed it. It's the uh, it's the word of God. Yeah, verse by, by verse, verse, transforming you. You can't go to these churches that just give these uh, motivational speaking. No, nope. that hype and that motivational yeah. message that's going to do nothing for you when the storms come. Mm-mm. It's only through the word of God, the teaching of the word of God, yeah. which will transform yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you for this interview. Thank you for being on. I love that you quoted my dad and Sierra. <laughs> all of us, because we're all in the same game. We're all together. <laughs> Just letting our light shine. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. This has been Live with Ryan Reese. To connect or find out more about Ryan, click on ryan-reese.com. Check us out next Saturday at 9 p.m. for Live with Ryan Reese.